The heart and center of every worship service is when we gather around this book, the Bible. We anticipate what it is that God wants to say to us. God's word is so powerful and active, it's living and it's alive in each one of us. So every time we open this book, we're always anticipating what is it that God wants to say to each one of us. Today, we continue in our series on the glory of Christ as we turn to an important passage, the story of Jesus' transfiguration as found in Mark 9, 2 through 10. Here's what we read. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There, he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept this matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. Wow, this is such an important passage, such a pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry. When we speak about the glory of Christ, we really can't do better than this passage. I think there's at least three things this passage teaches us. First, who Jesus is. Second, what he came to do. And then third, how to connect to him. We'll take them one at a time. Let's start with who Jesus is. If you've been reading the Gospels up until this point, you won't miss it. So many people are asking an important question. Who is this? Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Who is this? The demons submit to, to him. Who is this? He teaches with authority. Who is this? The deaf hear, the blind see. Who is this? And now this passage tells us. So I'm standing in my city, Port St. Lucie, at Mets Stadium. It's spring training, and those of you who know me know I love baseball. Now, I, I think I have just the perfect illustration to help us understand what the Transfiguration's all about. There's this great video that I love. It's, it's in the video is Chris Bryant, the Cubs uh, all-star, third baseman, a slugger, and Hall of Fame pitcher, Greg Maddox. Only the thing is, uh, Greg Maddox is in disguise. Here's a setup, Red Bull is gonna make a commercial and they, they say they wanna film Chris Bryant taking batting practice. What Chris Bryant doesn't know is that Greg Maddox is disguised as the sound guy. And he's there and he's making comments about, hey, maybe you could hit the barrel of the bat so it sounds better. And you know, Chris Bryant looks a little annoyed. At any rate, at some point in the video, his personal throwing coach has to take a call and has to leave. And that's when Greg Maddox, the sound guy, says, well, I'll do it. And at first, Chris Bryant says, no, I mean, you can't do it. He says, no, I throw to my kids at Little League. And then he goes to the mountain, starts throwing pitches, and Chris Bryant can't believe what he sees. He's throwing curveballs, and they're all coming in as strikes, and he just can't believe that this random sound guy is throwing like this. <laughs> this sound guy's got a good curveball. What is this? It's pretty good. No. Anyway, at the conclusion of the video, uh, the sound guy, Greg Maddox, says, hey, can you autograph a bat for me? And he says, sure, I'll do it. He says, make it out to Greg Maddox. And that's when the joke is up. And there's this moment where he takes down his disguise. And now Chris Bryant sees him as he is. He's Hall of Fame pitcher Greg Maddox. At any rate, uh, an insight into the transfiguration. That's this moment. Uh, Jesus shows Peter and the other disciples who he truly is. You know, there's this great Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. 
and a wonderful line. It says, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. And that's what this is all about. Jesus is the incarnate deity. He's the Godhead just with a veil. And just for a moment on top of the mountain, Jesus removes the veil so that Peter and James and John see Jesus for who he is. In that moment, they see his glory and his splendor, dazzling white. They see him for who he is, the Godhead, the incarnate deity. That's who he is. This is how Mark puts it. He says that Jesus was transfigured before them. His entire appearance changed. Verse 3 says that his clothes became dazzling white. In fact, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. If you read Matthew's gospel, he says that Jesus' face was shining like the sun. Luke, in his gospel, talks about how Jesus' clothes became whiter than a flash of lightning. Uh, there was something glorious, majestic, uh, unbelievable about his appearance. Now, this passage mentions Moses and the cloud, and you can't help but draw the parallels between the Old Testament story. In the Old Testament, Moses, when he went up on Mount Sinai and entered the glory cloud of God, the Bible says that when he, he came down, his face was, was radiant. It was reflecting the glory of the light of God who he had just been fellowshipping with on the top of Mount Sinai. Now, Moses was like the moon, which was reflecting a light. Um, you know, the moon is reflecting the sun's light, but this passage is saying that Jesus is the sun. He's the source of this glory and majesty and light. I mean, make no mistake, Jesus, here this passage is saying he's, he's God. The book of Hebrews puts it this way, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Who is Jesus? He is the exact representation. He is the, he's God, the radiance of God's glory. Um, this is what all of a sudden, as Jesus lowers the veil, so to speak, the disciples see. In fact, this is interesting. Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here and let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And then the Bible says that Peter didn't know what he was even saying. They were so frightened. Here's, here's the idea. When Peter sees Moses and he sees Elijah who represent the law and the prophets, these are the greats. Um, Peter says, oh, and, and Jesus is, is one of the greats. So he wants to make, as it were, a hall of fame for these great religious figures. But just when he says that, notice what happens in verse seven, a cloud appeared, it covered them. And then there's this voice. The voice said, this is my son. And then when the cloud disappears, Moses and Elijah, no, there's only Jesus. What's this passage saying? It's saying that Jesus isn't just one among others who are part of a hall of fame. No, uh, Moses and Elijah, they were pointing to Jesus. Moses and Elijah were, were seeking after God. Jesus was the God they were seeking. He, he's in a league all his own. He's unique. There's no one like him. He's holy. He is the son not just one of the prophets, not just one of the lawgivers, not just one of the figures in the Bible. Uh, he's the center of all of scripture. That's who he is. It's probably worth just a moment to pause and reflect on something. Uh, it's interesting what's happened, especially in Europe and North America the last 100 years. Those who are the clergy, those who are in positions of Christian influence, you know, the, the thought has been that, boy, we have to do something to make Jesus more relevant to a modern audience. And particularly in the last century, there was an effort to say, listen, today in our modern age, you know, when we've got things like television, electricity, and the internet, people can't believe in the supernatural anymore. And so we've made Jesus a, a good teacher, a wise sage. We've even made him someone that you could sit down and have a cup of coffee with. 
But listen, <laughs> if you understand what this passage is saying, Jesus isn't someone you just sit down and have a cup of coffee with. He, he's God. And the idea that we'd strip him of the supernatural, that we take away the fact that he's a miracle worker and, and he's not bound by the things of this world. Uh, listen, in nations where they embrace the supernatural, you think of Africa or Asia, um, you know, Christianity is still exploding. It's here in the West where it's receding. Why? Because, listen, Jesus isn't just one of the great religious leaders. He's not just one of the great prophets. He's God. And if you want your Christianity to come alive, if you want your faith to be alive, then you have to recognize who he is, which is what was happening for Peter, James, and John on the top of that mountain. Now, second thing this passage teaches us, what Jesus came to do. Now, right before this passage is this very famous account of Jesus with his disciples asking, who do people say that I am? And some people said John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets, but who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. And then we read in the Bible that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And the Bible says that he spoke plainly about this. Of course, Peter and the other disciples, they, they couldn't understand that. And they'd concluded Jesus is a Messiah, so he can, you know, he's going to go reign in power. And when Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to suffer, you know, that they have no category for that. And in fact, Right after this story is the story of the transfiguration. I think it's placed in such a key place. You know, Peter, James, John, the other disciples, even us, if we didn't know about the transfiguration, we might think to ourselves, well, Jesus was overpowered. You know, he had one plan, which was to be the Messiah, but, you know, he had to move from plan A to plan B. But this story of the transfiguration shows us that there was no plan B that no one was taking Jesus by force or dragging him away from his, his other plans. It wasn't like Jesus was drugged anywhere. He didn't go anywhere unwillingly. Listen, we see it. It's as though Jesus is on the top of the mountain. He lowers the veil. We see who he is. We realize he's the all-powerful God of the universe. No one's going to place some ropes around his hands as though that was going to hold him down. It's not that he's doing anything unwillingly when he goes to suffer in Jerusalem. He's going to do the very thing he planned all along. He's not being dragged away. He's willingly going. It's his plan. It's his purpose. So that shows us what he came to do. He loved you. He loved me. He loved us. And he had a plan all along to go and save us from our sin, to take our sin upon himself so that as he hung on the cross, our guilt, our shame, our wickedness, our debt that we owe to God would be put on his shoulders. He'd be punished in our place. He loves us. This passage is so important because it points out he came to do this. He wasn't dragged away unwillingly to the cross. Jesus went by his own power, by his own decision, by his own willingness, and he did so because as he looked at you and he looks at me, he loves us and wants to rescue our souls. That's what he came to do. Now, third, how to connect to him. And there's really three things that I think this passage points out that I'd like to just share with you today. The very first of which is this, that if we want to connect with him, we, we pray. We have what I'll call a top of the mountain experience. You know, if you joined us last time, we talked about how Jesus was up on the mountain and the disciples were down in the boat on the Sea of Galilee and they were straining at the winds and the waves and Jesus saw them and he came down from the mountain and he, he went across the winds and the waves and he, he got in the boat with us. Jesus, as it were, was, was willing to enter our suffering. But now, check this. 
he invites us to join him at the top of the mountain. He, he's encouraging us to, to, as it were, walk up the mountain and commune with him and fellowship with him. It's interesting, the other gospels, they take note of this. For instance, in Luke chapter nine, this is how the story of the transfiguration begins. It says, after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain, and now notice this, to pray. And then it says, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. That's when his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. It, it's prayer. And now here's what prayer does. It helps us move from knowing about Jesus to knowing Jesus. It's, it's having a relationship with him. We move from head to heart. We move from our intellect to an existential knowledge of Jesus. Now we all know maybe what that looks like. I, I, I think of it this way. Um, kids who go on their very first mission trip. You know, I've seen this with teenagers so many times. You know, their parents all along could be telling them, listen, you ought to be more grateful. You ought to be thankful for what you have. There are children living in other places who have nothing compared to you. They live on just like a dollar a day and you have everything. And you know, the kids know that in their head, but I've seen it as they've gone on mission trips. They go out and they experience it. And what they know intellectually, they know that there are kids who have less than they do. What they know intellectually, now they know existentially. And these teenagers return and now they are more grateful. Now they are more aware. They're, they're eager to serve others and not make everything about them. Boy, I've seen this a million times and I'm sure you have too here. Knowledge needs to move from our head to our heart. And it's one thing to know about Jesus. Listen, if you come to church on a regular basis or listen to the online worship services, you'll know about Jesus. Uh, you'll learn things about him, but, but when you go up on the mountain, as it were, when you spend time in prayer, you relate to him, you fellowship with him, you, you have an experience with him, and it's as though that knowledge of Jesus moves from your head to your heart. Why is that so necessary? Well, here, come with me. So let's talk about this movement from knowledge that goes from head to heart. You see, in prayer, we don't know only about Jesus, we get to actually know him. Here, it's so fascinating to me that in the passage right before, Jesus had asked this question, who do people say that I am? And Peter answered, and he got it right. He said, you are the Messiah. Peter knew the truth. He, I, I, I know who you are. But then, but then on the mountain, I would say that that knowledge, it, it went to another level. It, it went into a second gear, so to speak. When Peter saw Jesus transfigured, now it's not just he knows about Jesus, he, he experiences him on the mountain. That's what happens in prayer. Our knowledge moves from knowledge about Jesus to knowledge of him personally as we experience him in the context of a relationship. Here, uh, maybe this will help. I'm standing in front of our new elementary school building. So pleased to be able to just show you the progress in the background. Anyway, I'm doing that because here, I wanna give you a pop quiz. Uh, true or false? True or false, Jesus is God. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. He's totally in charge of every event that happens in this world. And if you're a Christian, you know the answer is true. You, you know it, okay? Second question, pop quiz, true or false? Uh, Jesus loves you so much that if you were the only sinner there was in the world, he would have entered this world and took on flesh. He would have suffered and died to rescue you. Uh, true or false, Jesus loves you that much. And if you're a Christian, then you know that's true. You, you know it here, but now let me ask a question, follow up. Why are you still anxious about things? Why are you still worried about, well, what if this happens or what if that happens? Um, why do you still have besetting and secret hidden sins that you don't wanna let go of? Why? 
It's because you know something here, it needs to drop down here. It needs to move from the intellect to something you experience. There's a second gear that happens when, as we're invited by Jesus to go up on the mountain, we meet him in prayer. And uh, I think that's so important to do. Get to know Jesus in prayer so that your knowledge of him moves from knowledge about him up here to ex experiential, existential knowledge down here. All right, the second thing on how to connect to Jesus. Uh, we come in community. I want you to notice this, that when Jesus went up the mountain to be transfigured, he, he took Peter, James, and John with him. He didn't go alone, nor did he take anyone alone. There was a community, a, a small group, if you will, who were experiencing Jesus together. Boy, especially after 2020, I think there's something that we really need to take to heart. It's almost like we learned the principle by way of negative example. 2020 was such a year of isolation where so many of us felt alone. And it must have occurred to all of us at some point, this is not the way God intended us to live. And it's not the way to know him and experience him. We were meant for community. We were meant to be together. Listen, Jesus, I, I think, was brilliant. He, he started a church, a family, where people, they seek him together. And I can't, I can't overstate how important this is. No real life transformation happens in isolation. All real change, all real life transformation happens in, in community with other people. That's how it happens. I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. I think actually there's at least three people that you need with you at all time. As you're coming to Jesus, you need someone who's ahead of you in the faith. You need someone who's behind you in the faith. And then you need some people beside you. Why do you need someone ahead of you? Well, there's things about Jesus that as you come to him, you'll just, it'll surprise you. You won't understand. You'll, you'll need an explanation. And someone who's further ahead can say, oh, well, think of it this way. Here, this is how you can frame it. And that person can help guide you into what the life of Christianity is all about. Every person who's a Christian needs a mentor, someone to help them understand when they don't understand. We also all need a disciple, someone further behind us. Why? Well, it's because when our mentor tells us things, we nod our head and say, oh, I understand. I think even as people listen to sermons, they hear what the pastor's saying. They say, yeah, that makes sense. I get that. But it's when the person asks you, hey, what is this about? That all of a sudden you realize, hmm, how would I put it? I don't yet understand. And, and that person, because they're asking you, it's almost as though they force you to finally grasp it, to have it as your own. And uh, that's why it's always important to be turning around, as it were, to be teaching someone who's further behind. But then we also need people beside us, people who are on the same journey with us so we can wonder together, so we can worship together, so that we can pray together. And I just take note that as this passage goes forward, it says this, that Jesus told them not to tell anyone, and they kept the matter to themselves, but among them, they were discussing it. They were discussing what, what Jesus meant when he said he was going to rise from the dead. They were chewing on it together. And there's something so important that happens when people bring their different viewpoints, what they see, what they know, they bring it together and it strengthens the community. Here's the point I'm making. We come to Jesus in community. Finally, how do we connect with Jesus? I love how this passage puts it. When that cloud envelops him, we hear the voice of the Father say, this is my son whom I love. And now this, listen to him. If you want to draw close to Jesus, then this is how to do it. You listen to him. You, you lean into his word. How do you come to know him? You come to know him through his word, through scripture. Boy, I, I don't even know how to get this across, how important the Bible is. The Bible is the power of God for salvation. The good news of the Bible, the gospel of Jesus, it has an, an inherent power. 
when we listen to the Bible, when we take in scripture, that is how we draw close to him. And anyone who's a Christian needs to take this seriously. You may say to yourself, well, I've been saved by grace, and so there's nothing I need to know. Sin, salvation, service. There's the Christian life. And the voice from heaven didn't say, oh, okay, you're saved, so just move. No, listen to him. Take in his word. I want to invite everyone, especially this year, if you don't have a daily Bible habit, if you're not in the habit, we, we have some, some things to help you here at Sunlight. Bible steps, public reading of scripture, Listen, if you have been saved from your sin, you're set free to serve him. And one of the most important ways you can do that is, is to connect with him by listening to him speak to you in his word. And I just encourage you to get to know scripture. Listen, this passage I think is so key. It shows us who he is. He's the God of gods. He's the great I am. He's the one who, who is the exact representation of the glory of God. He is God. It shows us what he came to do. Jesus wasn't dragged unwillingly to the cross. It was his plan. It was his purpose. He, he loves you. He wants you to be saved. And I just encourage you, come to him. And finally, this passage shows us how to connect to him. It shows us how how in prayer, in scripture, in community, there's a God-ordained path that we can get to know him more and more and more. And I encourage you to do just that today. We've come to the conclusion of our worship service today. Thanks again for joining us. You know, it always strikes me that at the conclusion of every worship service, we should always take a moment to just sum up, to grab hold of what we saw, what we heard, what we know to be true, and then what that means. A moment for application. I think as we do that, one of the impulses has to be this, that we commit ourselves to Jesus once again. That we say all of who I am, all of what I have, all my gifts, my talents, my resources, all the relationships that God gives me, all my time, it's all his. I encourage you as a part of this worship service to leave an offering. As you do, let it be a token. Just a, this offering I give, Lord, it just represents that I'm ready to give it all in whatever way you call me. So as you go to do God's work today, as you commit yourself to him, I invite you to go with this blessing. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, Amen. Go in peace to love and serve him today. Thanks so much for viewing this sermon. I hope you enjoyed it. For more content like this, please subscribe below and I'll see you next time.